Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, we're going to learn about linear progression and ordinary least squares. Now, when researching this topic, I thought, linear regression, that's been explained a trillion times on the internet. How the hell do I make this one cool? But then I realized all my videos are about math. None of them are cool. And that took the pressure off. So instead, I'm going to focus on the most practical aspects of this topic, things that you must know if you want to use it. Also, I'll emphasize the general principles that are useful beyond linear regression in the bigger and badder arena of machine learning. To spoil it for you, I'll tell you exactly what I'll cover up front. First, I'll explain linear regression and then ordinary least squares, which I'll call OLS for short. I'll set up its problem and show you why its solution is so special, though sometimes problematic. Next, I'll run through the mathematics that express this idea most generally and precisely which I think is an absolute must learn if you want to apply this stuff. This will involve some linear algebra, so it'll help if you already know that, but if you don't, still watch. All the essential ideas will be spoken in plain English. With that, I'll show you how you can get distinctly nonlinear effects from this seemingly linear tool. And that'll open up the beautiful and deep world of basis expansions. Also, it'll help to mention what I'm not covering in this video. I won't be covering the sampling distribution of the coefficient estimates, so no p-values, I also won't be covering the list of assumptions required to make this model technically applicable. Also, everything else related to linear regression and OLS that isn't in this video won't be covered. Sound like a good deal? Well then, let's begin. First, we need to set up the problem facing linear regression, and that is to learn a function for which we have noisy observations. For example, let's say we were given these data points, and we want to find the function that we think produced these points after it was contaminated with noise. Now, in the face of this, linear regression makes a bold, though extremely powerful assumption. It assumes that the function is linear. In this case specifically, that means our model is a line, any line. So it could be this, this, or this. You get it. But now the question becomes, of all possible lines, which one makes for the best guess of the function that produced this data? Well, from here, almost all approaches will take the following general approach. Come up with a measure of fitness, something that accepts a line and your data, and gives you a number that tells you how well your line fits that data. Then pick the line that optimizes that metric. Now, there are many different metrics you could pick from, but ordinary least squares chooses to minimize a metric called mean squared error. To see that, let's consider a single squared error. That is, we draw a vertical line between the line we're evaluating and one of the data points, and then use that to form a square. The area of this square is a single squared error term, but there are many. Mean squared error is the average of all of these. This is a measure of our fitness. When this number is small, we have a good fit. In fact, let's view this from a different angle. If you remember the equation for a line, you know it has two parameters, an intercept term and a coefficient. That means we can associate all possible lines with a 2D plane, which we call, in the general case, the parameter space. A point in that space implies a particular line. So, for example, this point implies this line. At the same time, since one line in the context of this data implies a certain mean squared error, then we can think of our error metric as a function over this parameter space. In fact, we can visualize the mean squared error surface. In the general case of any parameter space and any metric, this is called the loss surface, and it's super important in machine learning. Okay, now that we have this view, it's time to ask, why this metric? It seems a bit arbitrary. Why are we squaring anything here? Wouldn't something like mean absolute difference make more sense? Well, something like that is totally fair, but that choice is a modern luxury. Mean squared error was originally used way back in the day because it's very easy to optimize. In fact, and this is the punchline, we can calculate the optimal value immediately by doing simple algebra on our data. This is by far the most significant aspect of OLS, and of course, it's true in the higher dimensions as well. If you didn't have such a convenient solution like this, you'd have to search the space, crawling from point to point with something like coordinate descent. When the space is high dimensional, it can be ridiculously huge, and finding that global optimum becomes an impossibility, at least with current methods. So, OLS makes a big assumption, but for a huge win, we can always find the global optimum. There are linear models out there with thousands of parameters, and that parameter space is larger than anything you can imagine, and yet, with this approach, we can know absolutely the best choice of parameters. That is a big deal. But it's not without its downside. 
Squared error weighs a difference of 10 much greater than a difference of one. So if we have data that looks like this, we'll end up with a line which looks wrong. This is why there are many robust forms of regression which will have comma reactions to extreme points. Also, before moving from this view, I'll make one comment on parameter uncertainty. And that is parameter uncertainty really comes down to the shape of this loss surface. If we are very uncertain about our parameter estimate, that means there are large regions of the loss surface which yield losses very close to the minimum loss of our parameter estimate. That includes uncertainty due to too few data points or highly correlated variables or a ton of noise. They all cause large sections of the loss surface to become nearly optimal. If you have a lot of points which are nearly optimal, it's hard to say confidently which is the right choice. Despite these caveats, this is still an enormously powerful tool. But if you want to use it, you need to know the general math which expresses this idea precisely. So let's do that. Our starting point is that we are given data which can be represented like this. Here we have n observations indexed by i from 1 to n. Each observation has two things, an xi vector which has length d and a yi number. This is just a compact and general way of representing data I bet you're already familiar with, which looks like this. This big bold-faced capital X represents this big grid of numbers, where each row is an observation. Also, every observation of y is collected into a vector, which we represent with a bold-faced lowercase y. Also, if it's hard to see how this notation represents that data, then read this note, but otherwise, don't. With that, we can now state the primary assumption of linear regression. That is, we assume that our y values are a linear function of our x values plus an error term, which over the whole data set will average out to zero. Mathematically, that means we construct y with this expression. yi is the dot product of xi with our coefficient vector plus an error term. The linearity kicks in with the dot product. If it's unclear why a dot product implies linearity, then read this annotation. But if you already know that, or are willing to trust me, then no need. Also, we can express this idea identically like this, using matrix vector notation, which in this case allows us to drop the i. Next, let's move on to ordinary least squares. OLS tells us how we should choose our coefficients from our data. Specifically, it says we should choose those that minimize the mean squared error. If we do so, then we have the enormously good fortune of being able to calculate straight from our data the globally optimal coefficients, which is given with this expression. Okay, now, I'd like to take a minute to make a few comments on this equation. First, you'll see the inverse of x transpose x, which means that thing needs to be invertible. For that to be the case, we require a few things on x. First, there needs to be at least as many rows as there are columns. Second, no column can be a linear combination of any others. For example, the third column couldn't be two times the first minus the second. If either of these conditions are violated, then you effectively have a whole subspace of coefficients which optimize mean squared error. And therefore, our equation doesn't know where to point. And second, if you're writing code for performing regressions, never use this expression directly. Inverting x transpose x can be numerically unstable, especially when it's almost non-invertible. And that happens in practice a lot more than you may expect. Instead, use standard software built for this. It will set up the right system of equations and solve it with sturdy, robust methods. That said, you've now eaten the meat and potatoes of linear regression and OLS. The question is, are you up for dessert? Because on the menu is how to squeeze non-linearities out of this seemingly linear tool. In my opinion, this is where things get interesting and useful. Are you ready? Okay, the first thing we need to do is introduce the basis function. All this is is a function that maps from a lengthy vector to a number. That's what this expression means. A few examples include simply returning the second element from the vector, or taking the ratio of the second and the third, or taking the log difference of the first and the third, or taking the sine of the first, you get it. Any function will do. Now, let's say we had m of these functions. Well, then we could collect them all into one vector-to-vector -vector function, which I'll represent here with a bold-faced h. This thing maps from a vector of length d to a vector of length m. In general, since m is typically bigger than d, this is called a basis expansion. From here, it's easy. We just substitute h of x for x into our linearity assumption. That is, y is a dot product of h of x with a coefficient vector plus some noise. And then we just proceed as we did earlier. The idea here is you can get nonlinear effects from a linear model if you pass your data through something nonlinear before you feed it into that linear model. But this explanation is pretty abstract. Let's see it. 
let's say we were faced with this data. Clearly, a plain linear regression would be underdoing it. So let's get creative. Let's say we showed up with these basis functions, which is called a polynomial expansion. In that case, we would get a curve like this. Not bad, but can we do better? Let's try increasing the degree of this polynomial expansion. Okay, a bit better. But if we were to look closely, we'd guess that there is something sign-like in there. So let's add that. Oh, way better. But this hardly reveals the flexibility here. Let's try something else. What if our basis functions were indicators of whether x was in a particular range? Well, that would give us a piecewise constant prediction similar to a decision tree. But maybe that's too jagged. Okay, instead, let's say each basis function measures nearness to a particular point. We can do this by passing distances into the normal density function with some standard deviation that we've decided independently. Well, that would give us a kind of smoothly evolving moving average. Still, this horribly undersells the creative potential. Especially since, once our given data has more than one dimension, then you can apply basis functions to all interactions. And needless to say, the creative space explodes. But now, the fair question is, how do you choose these basis functions? Well, answering that is an endless avenue of research. Seriously, I mean, it's not much of a stretch to say that most neural network models are really just learning basis expansions, ahead of some typically very simple transformation like a linear one. So if you find it difficult generating such basis functions, you aren't alone. But as you can tell from the length of this video, this is where I'll be ending. If you'd like to learn more, I've included my sources in the description, so check those out. That said, thank you for your focus. If you enjoyed this video and would like to continue learning about statistics and machine learning, please like and subscribe. Content like this is the content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.